Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm today's host, Coleman Hodges. Joining us today, he is the first man from Australia to win an Olympic medal in the 50 meter freestyle. He's also the first man from Australia to go to four Olympics in swimming. And he is now the reigning Olympic champion in the men's 50 meter freestyle. Today, we're sitting down with Cam McAvoy. Cam, thanks so much for being here. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Um, things are going pretty well. Uh, been back a week, almost dealing with jet lag, dealing with the, uh, I guess, life post Olympics and post uh, Olympic campaign as well. And yeah, it's um, it's a lot to process. I'm a This episode of the Swim Swam podcast is sponsored by Commit Swimming, Swim Swam's exclusive team management software partner. Since 2015, Commit has been providing coaches with swimming's leading workout management software. And now, Commit has team management software too. Commit wants to help you make the switch from Team Unify to a simpler, more powerful solution. Their onboarding and customer service team will walk you through every step of the way. Check them out at commitswimming.com to book your demo today. That's C O M M I T swimming. Dot com. You've been to four Olympics, right? And I'm guessing each one comes with its own unique experience and its own unique come down and processing yep. period. But how has this one been different for you so far? Um, well, I mean, pretty much to put it straight up, this one's different because this, I, I probably walked away um, feeling satisfied with like, hitting the potential that I think I had at, at an Olympics. Um, so like the previous three, uh, for very, for different reasons. Um, yeah, I like it, it, the campaign just wasn't as good as I probably could have had it been. And so this one's just different in that sense, um, in terms of just the, I guess the overwhelming, like positive emotions that come with it. Um, I think at its core though, it's still, regardless of which way you tilt in terms of like uh like negative positive emotions of the olympics um at its core it's probably pretty similar anyway uh with a lot of the the process of going through the games or the lead up to the games going through it and then readjusting back into normal life um for the most part life pre-games is very determined um we have like we have our set goal we have a time frame for that goal um it's very there's a there's a very nice kind of self containment within that with life and then you finish and you're basically thrusted into into limbo in the sense where like you come back there's no immediate short-term goals uh there's no daily structure with training or anything like that it's just complete uh like formal structure into complete chaos and like regardless of how it goes um that's always difficult to deal with it's it's kind of funny when you put it like that because you hear about these post-olympic blues and obviously just coming off such of a massive high and like you said something you've been preparing for for so long and then you and then you like maybe maybe that should be changed like maybe people should make sure that they're going into another form of structure you know because <laughs> it's like when when you don't have that and obviously I, these athletes have worked so hard and under so much structure for so long that it's probably good to take a break from that but then yeah it it can be hard when your life doesn't have structure I think structure can add purpose <laughs> and, then, and then without yeah. that it's like what am i doing <laughs> yeah 100 percent. Right. and we're we're obviously uh very inclined towards like that type of life um <clears throat> we wouldn't thrive on that type of training environment for such a long period of time um if that just didn't align with how we were so yeah 100 percent. like it's a it's that fine balance you know like the coming back uh, getting into some form of normalcy and routine, um, having something that you can either move on to or have, uh, or yeah, have a little bit of, um, 
kind of space to be away from the sport, away from the general way of doing things. Um, but also you don't want to get too far away. You want to enjoy kind of the, what, what you've done, uh, for many, it's not, it's not just like a, you know, six to 12 month, uh, lead in it's a, it's a whole quadrennial or in this case, a, a, a three year, um, kind of cycle. And that's, that's a lot, like, especially like if you're, if you're late teens, early twenties, like three, four years, that's a pretty significant percentage of your life and so yeah like you definitely need to take that time to take stock <laughs> that's i hadn't thought about that before either that's yeah. such a good point that's, yeah you know the, it is it is a significant amount of your life and and probably to that point kind of the the prime years of your life right yeah um, yeah in a sense so how are you taking stock this time i mean what are you doing are you uh working out at all are you are you back in the pool at all have, have you just kind of <laughs> totally stepped away from that piece of it i'm currently trying to figure out what the rest of the year looks like um originally i had uh maybe world cups and world short course on the calendar um but yeah i think we're just trying to figure out what that's going to look like also what we want to do next year as well um and then reverse engineer from that so in terms of like training and everything um i'm just reining myself in uh not wanting to like wanting to think about kind of what it's going to be but not thinking about what i need to do right now um so outside of that it's really there's there's obligations that come with um uh coming back with a goal that like there's a lot of media commitments and all that type of stuff uh a lot of avenue avenues as well where uh within the sport um, there's a lot of outreach where they want you to come in and, uh, have a chat, kind of, uh, like share the experience to the more grassroots level, um, of swimmers around Oz as well, which I think is really important. So yeah, I think I'll probably, I'll do my best in that space. And, and, and then outside of that, just try and like uh, at home, just, just relax, you know, like, uh, like live normally. Um, I had like, I had a, a year and a half off already, um, couple of years ago so i'll just try and like get into that that type of uh frame of mind and, and routine and i'm sure i'll eventually i'll eventually get into like more of the like fun training non-swimming type of stuff get back into the gym and play around with that which i'm actually really excited about um but yeah first i've got to figure out what the next 12 months are going to look like uh and then go from there are you someone who in the office are you the type of person to like just go for a run or <laughs> no i you, you i'm not a runner i'm not not very well built for uh for like i wish i would run uh but in saying that i've been really interested i've obviously i've been learning a lot about track and field uh, particularly mm -hmm. like the sprinting and track i'm real keen to see what i can throw down for 100 running uh, I've i've been putting it off uh in the lead up to paris because Again, I'm not built for running and I don't want to do a hundred just for fun. And then something, something happens, but, um, yeah, I'm more like, I'd be more interested just to like, oh, I, I fell in love with rock climbing, um, on my time off. I'd love to go back and do a little bit of that for fun. Cause I had to cut that out cause it was too, um, it, it interfered too much with the, the swim specific type of things. Um, and then like, say if I'm not doing short course this year, um, I've got a bit of time before I can get back in the swim specific stuff where I can just go hard on the calisthenics on the gym side of things and yeah, just have a ball in, in that sense. So yeah, we'll see. I'm it's, it's kind of funny. I was listening to an interview with an American track athlete, Gabby Thomas. Yeah. When the, when the 200 and, uh, she said they run a mile once a year. On yeah. like the first day of practice right to it's like yeah. a gut check <laughs> and she's like i would never do anything that long again <laughs> yeah well that's similar vibes to i think bolt got interviewed one year around maybe around rio time they resurfaced uh recently as well and it was like he's just straight up like yeah i'm not a lap guy like i don't i don't do laps and like he wouldn't even do <laughs> a lap of the field like what's that one quarter of the mile or something like that so yeah same energy there 
That's I was I was trying to think about that. Like, what would that be in swimming terms? But like, I don't know if they're like, I, I really don't feel like that's comparable, especially for sprinters. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much like what the mile. What's that? Three just under four minutes. So, yeah, maybe it's like a 400 max or something like that. You think I mean, you'll I'd, do that I'd on day one? I'd finish at 400 max. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how quick it'll be, but I'd finish it. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, I feel like that's good. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, I I thought that was kind of funny and also um, it, an interesting like version of cross training, I guess, or something yeah. that you well, wouldn't. It's normally... fitting as well. Like, like it's very like yeah. My training in the last let's say eight eight months has really shifted uh, toward like that type of mindset, really. And can you, can you expand on that a little, just of that type of mindset of, of not, not really doing the traditional distances you would do in training? Yeah. Uh, with respect to obviously 50, um, sprinting, but yeah, it's very much shifted to like, if I spend a lot of time thinking about it and there's different kind of representations that you can look at a 50 meter free um traditionally in swimming it's it's uh not just for the 50 but all events um it's been very heavily collapsed in the metabolic viewpoint uh which has taken the sport a very long way and it's a very valid way of looking at all events um but i was thinking about it and you could see and look at the different events from not only the metabolic point of view but then you have uh like a strength point of view a power point of view a technique point of view um in terms of like a systems approach where like if, if i dive in and i do a 50 meter max uh in freestyle then all of those exist at the same time like all of them are happening at the exact same time uh during that race like you've got my energy systems that are that are acting to get me from one point to the other you've got the strength that i'm exerting on the water and and, and everything that's propelling me you have the power so the speed of that strength that's being exerted and then you have the technique the shape of the stroke and all of them exist so kind of talk from that was we asked myself what would free be like training out of that metabolic viewpoint from a view and a power point of view and a technique point of view where like if you look at um just general strength training for example one of the like make-believe metaphors that that i leaned on a lot was like imagine if your sport was 10 reps of pull-ups uh with 40 kilos and you had to do it as fast as you can uh, with like strict form you had to get your chin over the bar um and say yeah say for example like that's a rough like rep range like type of stuff and say that might that might take i don't know someone to do so ties we're looking like that's pretty equivalent to what a 50 freestyle would be like so if you're exerting effort for the same period of time then you can check kind of the, the metabolic uh and energy system um equivalencies off pretty much so because of that then you can kind of look at it from the strength point of view where uh how, how would the strength world train and view that type of event and that's pretty much where i took it and ran from it because instead of looking at it from like your aerobic anaerobic atp energy levels uh a lot of it would be kind of to really simplify you'd be trying to raise your max strength your one rm because then you can work in that uh strength reserve element of that so like someone who can pull up a 100 kilos can do 10 reps of 40 easier than someone who pulls up 60 kilos uh, and then the other end is your strength endurance in terms of like you have to be able to do 10 reps at 40 kilos to begin with and even better if you can do 10 at 60 or whatever um then that works out well and so yeah from there um i, I decided to try and take what i could from that and recontextualize that to swimming to the 50. um what would that look like in terms of like structuring resistance training uh what does it mean to have like a one rm max strength in a freestyle stroke for example um and then strength endurance around like how much weight can you move close to the technique that you're doing in a race 
um, for a period of time that's close to what you're going to be sprinting for as well. Um, and yeah, really took that change in viewpoint and, and ran from there and just like, I, I just thought, where's this going to take me? Uh, I'll be the guinea pig for this type of thing. And yeah, we'll see where we land. I'm I'm so like <laughs> just hearing you talk about this. I'm so excited to 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 keep going with this conversation. How, first of all, how did you get there? Was was this something that that you started thinking about and developing when you had retired, when you would come out of retirement? Is this or is this maybe a theory that someone else brought to you and then you ran with it? Um, the second one. So there's a uh, Stephen Pauline Richards out of the UK. Um, they created IPSA, International Psychosystems Analysis, um, and they basically created uh, like the theory or kind of the the skeleton of what I used to do uh, to deconstruct my training. Uh, but their context was in um, frontline clinical help for psychology and people in need in that sense. Um, they call it uh, informational monism and superposition theory. Um, where it's basically a biopsychosocial approach to clinical health. Um, I mean, it's not just psychological in terms of uh, people in need of like psychological issues, but whole spectrum, um, biopsycho uh, and all that type of stuff. And so I, and I, in my time off, and actually in, even just before my time off, around the COVID break, uh, I can't remember how I stumbled across it, but ended up, um, seeing a lot of their stuff and then studying under them for a number of years, um, uh, not to do with swimming, just, just their ideas. Um, and yeah, it was really, really getting to, to learn kind of how they use a system based approach for and, and psychological wellbeing, uh, and then realizing, I guess, the power of that model and how that can effectively be applied to pretty much like any niche little area. And that's why I, I, I took that systems-based approach, put it into swimming where a real simplified, simplified model was what I said earlier, where you have like your, your energy system, then you have like your strength output, power, technique, and how they all exist on the same, uh, at the same time and whenever you're doing some sport or exercise or whatever it is. Uh, the point that I used to kind of flesh it out from there and then that led into uh, the time I spent um, like in the uh, like strength world, uh, calisthenics, gymnastics world, world, the rock climbing world. Um, and then when I started learning about uh, track and basically learning the different like track, your swimming, your strength kind of worlds, they have very different philosophies of approach. They have very different viewpoints of how they see it all. And it was really just like using the ideas that these guys came up with gave me that kind of deeper structure skeleton that allowed me to kind of compare all of them uh, and, and take a little bit from here, take a little bit from there, put it into the world of swimming and then see what that spat out in the end in terms of pro programming and, and yeah, changing of how I view the sport really. Now, when you were observing uh, strength, the strength world, the, the track world. I mean, were you, um, just, you know, watching videos and doing research? Were you going to different coaches and athletes and speaking with them? Um, I mean, how did, how did you gather that portion? A uh, bit of everything. So in my time off, uh, in 20, I moved to Sydney for, there for nine months, I think, uh, I joined, um, a, a place called AIM. Anatomy in Motion um, under I, I had no uh, end result in mind. I had no swimming uh, intentions in mind. Um, I just joined because I wanted uh, to improve my mobility, but I also wanted to learn how to do really cool calisthenics movements, but also general strength stuff. And he ticked all those boxes. Uh, and he was an incredible mentor in the sense of, um, being introduced to, to, I guess, the, the philosophies of the strength world, how they approach all of those different things, um, how to like, even how, like right down to how he was programming everything. Um, so that was kind of my first little introduction. And then 
it was fine who I could find in person to chat to. Uh, like for example, the the track side of things, uh, there's a lot of YouTube content out there. Um, not only with like the actual athletes viewing their their session. Um, where I'm at my gym, um, the Queensland Academy of Sport, I, I often do it alongside uh, all of the track guys that train out of there as well. Um, so I can pick their brains and what they do, um, pick their SNC guys and their coaches and what they do, get an understanding there. Um, even like in the in the gym world, there's a there's a guy called Ruslan who I follow on uh, Instagram. He's got my squad records for like number of uh, pull ups at certain weights, like the amount of pull like pull ups done um, under I don't know thirty kilos, fifty kilos, whatever it may be. Um, and I, I reached out to him. Like it's a perfect. It's like my the metaphor I said earlier was like reached out to him, basically outlined like what I'm trying to do, and I was just like, can I learn how you view what you're doing, how you're training for it. He was like, yeah, like, like, yeah, like he sent me paragraphs after paragraphs of what he's doing, what he's learned about. Um, it was incredible. So, yeah, it was really just like anyone and everyone who kind of overlapped with what I was trying to do, um, I'd just reach out and hope for the best. Yeah. And so at, at this time, I guess it, when you were – retired or just when you were getting out of retirement, you know, you mentioned every, everyone who had anything to do with what you were trying to do. What were you trying to do? Did you, did you have a goal in mind or how did that goal shape in terms of, yeah. you know, thinking differently or, or training or performance wise? Um, well, up until I'd say June ish, 2022, um, it wasn't swimming related. It, it was just general interest. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to get stronger. I wanted to learn about all that type of stuff. Um, I was doing, I was training every day in, in that sense. So like if I'm spending so much time wanting to do that, I want to commit to understanding like what I'm doing, why I'm doing the, like the direction I'm wanting to go. Um, but then when I, there was a photo I put on, Instagram in, in Paris on a holiday we went in in the middle of 2022 and that was kind of the the kickstart moment mentally where I was like right I'm, I'm I've learned a fair bit I don't know what it's going to look like now but I think it would look different and it, it on paper it kind of has to work to some extent I'm keen to try this out and so it was like on that holiday I was like right I'm ready to see what it's going to be like in swimming um, but there's a photo there. It's just like me in front of the arc, the arc um, de triomphe, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I got I got an Olympic shirt on from Tokyo, and it's just like reconnaissance is the uh, the caption, which is pretty cool. That was like the the day I was supposed to do it, and then from then on, it was um, yeah, at like 50 freestyle in my well, originally it was 50 free to then go on to 100 free. Um, like the first year, I wanted to get my speed up. I wanted to get mentally. I was like right. If I can get sub 22, that'd be awesome. Um, if I can get deep into the 21s again, that'd be great. Maybe like 21.7, 21 21.8. Uh, and then I can use that speed to then go on to uh, the 100 free for Paris. Um, but then the 50 free went so good or so well so fast that that kind of scrapped the 100 off and was like, right, let's, let's stick to this 50, um, see what we can do with that. So, so, yeah, probably it was just all like, swimming specific, very swimming specific and how how much can i refine it because even like when you when you when we first started with me and tim we had our general understanding of what we want to do, but error really like we you don't know what type of weights you use you don't know what type of volume of um like sprint reps you can handle in a day or in a week or in a block um for the most part it's even even up until paris like it's it's a lot more refined now than what it was when it started but there's still like tons of areas where we're like we're throwing darts in, in, in a dark room and hoping it sticks type of thing like there's there's so much refinement to go yeah and i feel like we it was it was really cool the last year and a half because it, it it feels like you've been very open about this process and we've kind of gotten to to go on it with you i know you know 
the one example was um, at the Doha World Champs where yeah. you had said, I'm just going to try to go all out every round and, and see how it goes. Um, yeah. So when you started with Tim, I mean, you know, you're like, okay, I have this goal. I'm going to try to apply what I've learned to swimming. Um, was it was it hard to find a coach who was who was agreeable to do to do yeah. this? Um, so when I first started looking for a place to do this, uh, like I wrote up this massive document that kind of outlined the beginnings of what we wanted to do. Um, sent that out to a handful of people for advice. Um, I wanted eyes over it and, and I respected the advice they would give in return. Um, but also like to be like, look, is this a thing you want to accommodate? Um, and like some people were like, no, we just can't do it, which is like, it's understandable. Like, you have a group of, I don't know, five, 10, 15, 20 people um, doing a very specific way of approach. And then one person has a significantly different one. Like, it's like, it, it's very understandable to not be able to balance that. And that's totally fine. Um, a few other people just straight up left me on red, uh, which kind of sucked. Uh, and then really it was, I did Aussie short course um, trials in 2022 uh, off the back. I think I, I got back from Europe, did like, I don't know, like six sessions in the water and, and entered the 53 just for fun. Um, and then it was at that that I was chatting to Bobby Hurley, who then put me in contact with Tim because um, Bobby did a similar style of approach to, um, I guess, his training with Tim back in 2017 uh, and was just like, yeah, give it a go, meet up with him, just like tell him what you want um and and see what he says and so that's how uh me and tim originally got the contact so shout out to bobby for for that that's um a very key uh i guess pivoting point in the last two years for us um and yeah met up with tim whole conversation was uh nothing to do with olympics world championships or anything in mind it was purely like i've been in the i've been in the sport for very long time. I'm pretty burnt out with it, with the traditional way of doing things. I need something different. Um, I've got these ideas. I'd love to try it out. And really, Tim's point of view was, I don't care how this goes, as long as you leave the sport when this is done with a better relationship to swimming than you have right now, then my job's done. Uh, and that, at the time, like I... I I was a little taken aback by that in terms of like, okay, that's a, that's not something you, you hear too often from a high performance coach. Um, but I didn't really realize how well of a grounding point that is for everything to flow on from in terms of like a starting point uh, from a relational point of view. Uh, and so, yeah, like I, I can't, I can't chat out Tim enough, not only, not only for that and having the, the type of character to, to come to a meeting like that and, and bring that type of, uh, I guess, initial approach, but yeah, everything that has uh, flown on from then. Yeah. And, and so then just, uh, after that initial conversation and kind of after you, you get into it, um, when, when do you start talking about high performance goals from there? Um, it came pretty quickly. Uh, so I moved to Brisbane in the second week of October um and I, I was 20 I, I moved and like the next day i did a 53 at a local comp 22a a, a baseline of like where i was at um and then we had this the queensland state champs eight weeks later uh i did them not really thinking anything um would do much at all uh, i went and <clears throat> off the back of after a year and a half off um i'm 20 plus kilos off from my old race weight um within eight weeks i was already quicker than i was quicker than what i did uh i just lost connection we good oh yeah uh yeah i didn't get what what time did you go at Sorry. queensland yeah um so i went to queensland state it was eight weeks after starting back um and i went 22-0 and that was 0.3 quicker than what I did in Tokyo. That was quicker than what I did at the Tokyo Olympic trials. Um, and that was, I mean, 
my average international 53 swim. So Rio, uh, 2017, 2019 was 20, 21.8 pretty much. I, I, I've done that at all those comps. So I was a stone's throw away from that. And that was, um, yeah, eight weeks into an 18 month off period being 20 plus kilos, um, above my, my regular race weight. So that was the first inkling where I was like, right, um, I'm already 22. Oh, we've got so much more we want to do. Um, let's yeah let's see where it, where this can go that was when it was like right i could probably get pretty deep into the 21s um but even you've got to bear in mind like I, I was so used to doing regular volumes that doing the type of volume i was doing then i still didn't have any understanding or idea of what taper would look like because if you're looking at strictly volume it's like what are you going to strip away and, and where are you going to get that jump from um and that was when uh, that was before I started to get a really, I guess, significant understanding of like neural fatigue and how much you can carry and, and how much that can be taken away and the the effects that have on, on the end result. Um, but yeah, like I was 22 on December um, and then it, it took me until May to go 21.8 or A21 for the first time. Um, and that was what four or five weeks before the world champ trials. So like that period was like, right, we're building up fatigue, building up fatigue, maintaining the same time. So we're not getting that breakthrough. And then when I had that taper into trials, I was like, right, I have no idea if I'm going to get on the blocks and I'm going to go 0.05 quicker and be 2175 or something, or, uh, if it's going to be different, but yeah, it was very much like a, it was, it was nerve wracking. It was very much a, a, a huge unknown at the time. So in that period where you're building up fatigue, as you said, which I think this is like, it's so interesting because swimming has been, you know, doing, has been tapering for decades, but yeah. like people still don't really know a lot. You're, it's still kind of a crapshoot sometimes, right? Um, in terms of, in terms of resting and how that will in fact affect your performance at at the end meet um and then yeah i mean one reason the isl was so cool is because we had people performing at a high level all the time and it kind of and and people have been doing that before but we've seen athletes perform at a high level all season right or for yeah. for a for a whole world cup um so sorry so it's it's just it, it's a fascinating topic to me but going back yeah. to your training block where you're building that fatigue. Um, what, what does the training look like then in, in, in the early stages when, again, you're trying to strip away the yardage, but you're still, you know, this is still very new. Um, you mean in terms of like the, as I'm starting to get into taper, like towards the end of the season? Um, just, you know, that f those, those January, February, March of, yep. I guess that would be 2023. Yep. So pretty much, uh, again, if, if you're looking at it strictly from the point of view of volume, like the whole way through was not much volume. Um, some sessions I'd get in and it would be kind of, it would be resistance stuff. I wouldn't even touch like the, the wall on the other end of the pool. I would, it wouldn't be a full lap. Um, cause it's just like type of thing. Um, but it like, again, leaning on the, the gym analogy it's it's like going through different phases of going up to your higher rep ranges like your your five your eight your ten your twelve rep ranges um doing your sets of that and then coming down to your one two uh, rep range as well um depending on where you are in that sense you have different levels of fatigue how far away or how close you are to your max your one rm as well um has some pretty uh significant like fatiguing elements too like if you're if you're hitting your one rm your two rm each week like you're going like that that gets a lot of neural fatigue it's going to take a fair bit of time to strip that away uh and the time between i guess optimal outputs is kind of larger and larger uh but as you get further away from that then you can kind of fit more volume in you can you can kind of um yeah move along pretty well and so swimming wise it was the same thing like uh i'd, I'd be playing around with um like the different resistance stuff in terms of 
uh, in like resisted endurance work. So uh, resisted stuff out out to let's say I don't know ten to twenty five second efforts, and then I'd be playing around with the shorter side that's much heavier in resistance, but maybe eight strokes long or something like that. Um, and then trying to balance uh, development with resistance in the stroke with kind of keeping in contact with body weight swimming because technically they're a little bit different as well. Uh, like you, you're, the way you do like a body weight 25 sprint compared to a very heavy resisted sprint, you've got to be really mindful that the resisted uh, like element to it doesn't change the technique too far. And so we had to um, develop tests that we could do that basically you, you did a you did a, a 12 stroke max at body weight and then 10 kilo, 20 kilo, all the way up to 100 kilos. Um, this is on the Destro, so like a one to 10 pulling thing. So think about it like with one kilo, two kilo, et cetera, up to 10 kilo. Um, and had like a velocity meter and did some mathematics to like the output and that kind of spat out uh, what weight was within range of the technique we did uh, body weight. And then if you go over this way, then your technique's kind of too far away from it. Um, So you can't avoid, you have to avoid that area. Um, So yeah, it's, it was a lot of stuff. Um, Like I, I got to much 2023 and up until that point, it was a mixture of body weight stuff, resisted stuff. Um, but I thought, like, right, what if I spend a bit of time purely just trying to get my max strength up in my freestyle stroke? And so I spent the whole of March, um, three times a week, every session was just under resistance um, and just a bunch of anywhere between like eight to 14 strokes max, um, as much volume as I can, as heavy as I can. For the entire month but i didn't do a, i didn't do a stroke of body weight swimming um and so yeah it was just playing around with that type of stuff without knowing it um i definitely overdid it in that block like the neural fatigue that that hit me from that was massive um but it was a huge learning experience too it was it was, it was a lot of fun to do it felt um felt a little bit rebellious you know coming from like your like before that season i was doing like your normal 30k a week type of thing and then now i'm just on a machine barely going past 15 meters for for a whole month um so it was just a it was weird to adjust to like the concept of that like it felt like i was it was a different sport um effectively like it was it was really cool terrifying at the same time but um yeah like very very uh satisfying in terms of like curiosity and 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 um like investigation into that type of stuff i love it i mean that's that, yeah it, it sounds um it's you know it sounds like i'm i'm watching a movie like you're telling me this story and it's like you know you're, you're the 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 main characters have come together and they finally hit on something um, yeah, yeah. It, it's really cool. it's been genuinely it's been like it's been a journey of a lifetime. Like, how often can you be within a field? Like I've been in swimming. I started when I was like four or something like that. Um, I've been swimming internationally since twenty twelve. Was twenty. How often can you be in a field for that long, and then you get the opportunity to basically. Uh, find the sport anew or or see it in a completely new light and experience it in a completely new light like that in itself has been the um i guess joy that has come out of this like the last two years that have been incredible in terms of success like the world champs the olympic gold and everything um and i'm extremely proud of them but that shift in terms of the relationship with the sport and just the 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 freedom and 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 the ability to see it in a new light is just like that's the thing that's got that's got that's going to stick with me for my life like that's the best part about this yeah and i mean i i i'm hoping that this this carries over well beyond just you to our sport too i mean because it's yeah it's very cool and it's very fun fun to hear about it sounds like a blast i mean the training yep sounds very involved uh and very detail oriented yeah. and i think for a lot of people that is probably a very good thing as opposed to 
the 30 K weeks that many of us are yeah. used to. Yeah. Which like that's, um, that gets results. Like a lot of that, that has put up some insane times in the world. Um, but I mean, if you do that for 20 odd years, like, it, it gets pretty tough to continually do that and find the, the, the passion in the little niche areas. Um, and yeah, I like. I hope it. I hope it goes out there and helps a lot of people. Um, hopefully, it provides like another avenue for people to to relearn the sport. Uh, I know like Tim's been like you have the the skeleton of of kind of the approach that I've taken for the fund up to other events as well, the hundred, the two hundred, and stuff. Um, like Tim's got a bunch of uh, younger swimmers that he's been coaching that um, he's been doing this type of thing all the way up to people who do 200 butterfly and just the, the, the results have been incredible. Like he's, he's had, um, there's one girl who's down at the junior pan packs in Canberra right now. She's about to compete in the 200 fly, maybe the hundred fly as well, but the 200 fly, um, she was doing 50, 60 K a week, uh, like the, the general 200 type of prep stuff. Um, and she hadn't done a PB for three years off the back of, no pbs um and then he's dropped her mileage down to like 20k uh per week over i think like five or six sessions and then two sessions that are heavy resisted focus it's like 1k in length in terms of like total volume but uh race pace and 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 development under resistance and i think she went from like a 217 to a 210 200 fly or something like that and and a 105 or 105 to a 101 102 hundred fly um and so like yeah it's incredible like that's at the 200 level as well um obviously that's it's still very different to like my one 2k at the moment but um it's scalable and and it just yeah i, I think it's it's a pretty exciting time no kidding especially when you put it in terms of that to make it more accessible to you know, non sprinters or, or people who aren't just focusing on a 50, which is, which is awesome. Um, yeah. So, so moving back to kind of your process, um, now, how, how did you learn or how did you taper that first time when you were going into the 23, uh, world champs and world champ trials? So I took a leaf out of the UK speed cycling taper. Um, so my S and C coach at the time, Scotty, he, he, he was head of UK speed cycling for Tokyo, um, post Fukuoka, he actually went back, um, and retook up that role, but their tapering method was, um, they would taper for, they do a full taper, two week taper for them into a mock competition that was about two weeks out from the actual Olympics. Uh, they would mock the entire Olympic program. Uh, with the idea of in that week, like hitting PBs um, or at the very least being exposed to race intensities that you just can't hit when you're in regular training. And so like you taper down, you hit that for a week, uh, which exposes you to that new stimulus because it's a new level of intensity. And then they rest for two weeks off the back of that. And the idea is that second time they race, they've been exposed to the like their goal speed, their PBs, and then they recover off the back of that. And maybe they can get another 0.1%, 0.2% gain off the back of that because they've, they've so using a mock racing thing as a training stimulus. Um, and so I pretty much took a, I took that, that, uh, that handbook and put it into swimming. So did a regular taper into our trials, um, did the trials, but usually you do, you, you do trials, you kind of rest off the back of that and then you slowly build up to your regular training before coming back, uh, back down again for, um, the second comp. But what we did was we tapered down, we raced at trials, but then for example, the 50 free trials was kind of day one of the next block, which was just as frequently as possible, um, suit up and do reps at the new speed that I can hit. Like I was 22 all season, um, that year. And then I was 21 to 21 four at trials. And then that kind of led into like a two, three week period where 
uh, instead of hitting 22-0 pace in training, I was hitting kind of your mid to low 21 pace. So I had a three weeks where I kind of got exposed to that I hadn't been exposed to all year. And then off the back of that, had like two weeks of resting and letting the, the fatigue of that kind of dissipate and, and to come up. And I adapted to that new kind of race intensity and then went into Fukuoka. And then uh, all of a sudden, I was much more capable of handling your 21-2, 21-3 speed. Um, and it also kind of gave me that that little bump for that final to drop that extra 0.2 um, and, and go 21-0. This is, this is all fascinating. I, I love hearing about this. It's pretty cool. Um, well, yeah. like if you, you take it back to a gym analogy, it's like, say you do a whole bunch of, um, I don't know, five, six RM um, type of work in a block. Like you're doing like fairly, fairly big chunks of, um, of, of rep ranges. And then you taper down and you taper straight into a comp, which is a one RM. Um, it's probably more advisable to taper down and then you do a block of one, two, three RM type of work where you kind of, you get adjusted to the, the, the type of weights you want to throw around in the competition and then taper off on the back of that, as opposed to going straight into a one RM off the back of not doing anything at that level of intensity for the entire season. See, when you, when you say it like that, it sounds so simple. <laughs> Yeah, on paper, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Like, that's why I was so excited to do it. But it was also like, okay, is this actually going to work in swimming? Like, yeah, in gym, throwing around weights, yeah, it does. But, yeah, does it work in swimming? I, I mean, it it seems like more and more we're finding that, yes, it does. And obviously, you're yeah. a great example of that. But, um, yeah, it's it, it's exciting to see that, like, oh, yeah, this does work. and it it doesn't only make sense on paper it it can, yeah. can't be carried out i'm and i mean I'm like it, it makes sense that it would work for like pretty much other events as well like if you say for the 100 for example like you if you're someone who hits 48 4 48 0 in season in competitions um and then you taper down and you hit a 47 2 or whatever um if you had three weeks where you were hitting 47 two pace for, I don't know, as much volume as you can and then rested off the back of that, the next time you get up for a, a competition, like at least 47 two is going to be a lot more capable over three rounds. Like you, you kind of buffer yourself for the heat semifinal, which is a whole saga in and of itself. Um, but then also the idea of like, okay, could you adapt a little bit to it and maybe go 47 one or 47 Oh, or something like that. Like, I think it's pretty scalable. Yeah. I in in speaking of that, again, I I I've I have a lot of questions that have spurred. Um, in terms of breaking down the 50 or in terms of race strategy, I mean, I think that's something that doesn't get talked about a ton with a 50 because a lot of people will yeah. just say, well, you just sprint, <laughs> right? You just yeah. you flail your arms and go. Um I'm I'm curious if this brought a, a new light for you or a new way of looking at the race itself in terms of how you were trying to execute it and how you were training for each chunk of the race or, or each phase of yep. the race, if that's how you were looking at it. Yeah, um, it definitely evolved into breaking it down. Um, got like going into Paris, we spent a lot of time looking at, I guess, 10 meter segments after the first, after the dive. Um, so 15 to 25, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, um, and breaking that down in terms of being able to, like, for example, my strongest part of the 50 is pretty much from the 15 to the 40 in the sense where, well, let's say like more, more so the 20 to the 40, like I get out of the breakout, I can get to my speed, but I can hold that top speed for maybe another five meters or so compared to a lot of uh, the guys I race. Fifteen to twenty-five, twenty-five to thirty-five, was to basically, with the context of the Olympics in mind, and doing the heat semi-final, and wanting to get to the final um, with as much, I guess, energy in reserve as you can, um, 
then being able to yeah do that first 15 to 25 at like a rep and reserve type of feeling like in the gym again another gym analogy but um like you might be two reps in reserve to your max or something like that or like whatever weight you do um and so it's like figuring out okay how can i do that 15 to 25 segment where i'm going as fast as i can and it's a, it's the speed i want to hit but it's not max and then that allows me to move into the next segment where i can kind of start to like put the put the pedal closer to the floor build into it and kind of have another gear to hit for that next segment which like internally it feels like it's like a a step up in effort but like from the outside it's really like i'm still getting slower but it's just like decelerating a little bit um slower than normal uh and then yeah just trying to really work those segments as as you go through uh when i first started it wasn't that it was just like dive in and go um and then yeah eventually evolved to that uh but that's pretty much where we're at now um and yeah like you can like we learned a ton of stuff in terms of breaking down the different segments um like even just if you get my my i think i've i think i've done like 20 five sub 22 second swims in the last year if you get them all down and then put the segments side by side there's a ton of stuff you can learn about um about pretty much the end result and like what each segment is uh like for example there's no race that i was under 21 3 where the 15 to 35 segment was um what do you call it was slower than 900 at that 15 to 35 under nine then regardless of how much energy i've spent up until the 35 that last 15 is generally pretty even and then that kind of gives me doesn't guarantee but it gives me a really good um shot at being able to go sub 21 3 whereas if i'm like 904 or 905 then at no point i'm sub 21 3 even even with that last 15 that gives me that chance to kind of make up that type of thing so yeah it's fast like we only just started to look at it um and yeah i reckon i reckon there's a, a minefield in terms of what you can learn from all of that stuff going forward and yeah i'm i'm pretty pumped to look at it tim's very excited to look at it um a lot of our like biomex and, and sports science guys are real excited about it too so yeah like we're we're just scratching the surface to this stuff um that's again yeah it's that's exhilarating to hear just just breaking such a seemingly short race down into such even yeah. smaller little segments how we we you've you've posted a couple times about your 15 meter speed or your speed to 15 yeah. meters um tell me about the development of that and and what you've done to make that part of your race evolve yeah uh so yeah i started october 2022 um first testings i was like 5.6 to 15. um and then in the olympic final uh did my best ever 15 i was 5.16 to 15 uh, which is a massive improvement for literally a jump a couple of kicks underwater and i think it's like three strokes till i hit 15. um so yeah we're, you're like you're looking at 0.45 of a second improvement and I've done three strokes um it's it was it's such low-hanging fruit the amount of people I see in Australia and I'd say this is pretty equivalent worldwide who are let's say they're like 21 9 to 22 2 22 3 speed the amount of them who have a die 15 that's like 5 6 even 5 7 down to like a 5 5 uh these guys could these guys could easily be in the 21s without any change to their swimming ability from the 15 to the 50 just by fixing that that first 15 meters like that jump and underwater um and I, like even levels like i reckon there's there's a lot of low hanging fruit for people's first 15s to to really bring that i do five three rush um and yeah pretty much our plan of attack was because i was coming back off a long time not diving 
plus my like my 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 body was pretty different i was heavier i had a, a different um, strength output all that type of stuff we spent the first let's say half a year eight months just kind of doing a lot of dives not trying to intervene and and just letting like my body find its base point um because i went yeah when, like when you're reintroducing something um you adapt to it over time and you kind of get to a point where you, you kind of find an equilibrium where um, it's about the best you can do without making any technical changes and stuff. So we spent a lot of time just like letting it develop as is. Uh, and then once that kind of settled, then it was basically breaking it down to the time on the block, um, what you do in terms of that jump, the streamline on entry. And then for me, that five to 10 meter segment, because I break out, anywhere between like 10, 11 meters. So that five to 10 was really my weak point. Um, I like actually off the block, it's really quick. I'm, um, I can hit the water usually first, but then from the five to the 10, I'll decelerate tremendously compared to um, some of the guys, the best in the world at doing that. So on, the, on the block, it was initially, Get your get your max strength up in terms of your ability to jump, um, your just general leg strength ability, um, and then the the power power in which you can just yet yeah, vertically jump. Um, so I worked at getting my vertical jump up. I think I was like forty. This is like hands on hips, no um, no arm swing or anything. I was like forty seven centimeters or something when I started, and then uh, pre Paris I was fifty seven. So I put on 10 centimeters in a vertical jump there, which is really nice. Um, relatively speaking, it's still a long way off um, other people, like some of the best in the world. But from where I started, really great gains. Uh, and that transferred to the ability to get off the block uh, faster, much better. Um, I think my t we, we, we can track takeoff velocity at QAS. And I think I was like 4.7 meters per second or something when we started. And, and by the end, I was, I was pretty consistently 5.2, 5 5.3 5 um, off the block, which is a pretty big jump in, in takeoff velocity from when you hit the water. Uh, and then after that, it's, it's really just um, mobility. Like the, the, the way you can streamline and enter the water in that body shape. Um, along the way. Uh, we started tracking five meter time. Uh, and then I went on uh, this massive mobility journey with a guy called Matt Smith, um, who like has yeah fully fully program mobility that's put on the same pedestal as the sprint training, the gym, and everything. Um, it's got its own space in the week. It's got its own like like blocks and cycles and taper and everything. So uh, went really heavy in mobility. Um, and this guy like he's never swum competitively in his life like the, the first time he really he looked at swimming was when i got in contact with him and i gave him a screenshot of the 50 freestyle from tokyo just before the, the the guys were entering the water and without looking at results without knowing who is who he ranked pretty much uh he ranked the top three in terms of their dive and basically was like, all right, this person's going to be first to 15 and then this person and this person. And he got it all right. Um, and so basically, like, yeah, like he, basically with Caleb, for example, in that example, he was the only one in that race where from ankle to wrist, you could draw a straight line from joint to joint um, upon entry. So like when you hit the water, ultra streamline and you just go. Uh, and then Flo and Bruno, for example, you couldn't like at some point in that chain, there'd be a break that would be a compensation for mobility. And then that would then have a, an end result at the 15 meter mark. Um, and so we did a ton of work on shoulder mobility, hip mobility. Um, and I think I got my 10 meter time down from like 3.4 or something like three, yeah, three point four down to about a three oh eight or three oh nine, um, and that's purely from the entry. And I think at that point I've done four dolphin kicks or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, that's the the very long story of how we kind of, um, but summarized story of how we we fix that dive. 
That's, that's incredible. I mean, that's, it's so, so much work into such little details, but I saw that, yeah. um, the Instagram post about your first getting your first 15 down, but with, with the mobility. Um, and I thought yeah. that was really fascinating and surprising because you don't, I guess some athletes talk about that, but it's not, you know, it's not a widely talked about or very calm, exceedingly yeah. common practice. And yeah, it's like, maybe this should be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of the guys who are world best at this type of stuff have God tier mobility. Um, like you, you look at Jordan's underwater kit, like you watch his 2022 50 short course, where he, the underwater footage of him coming off the wall, um, it's insane. And then obviously Caleb's super mobile with the strength to go with it. And, uh, like Leon as well with his underwater kicks and everything. And like you, you watch him, he gets out of the pool in Paris and he like puts his hand up to, to wave at the crowd. And it's just like the shoulder mobility is just insane. Pan as well, that like there's videos that his physio and strength and conditioning guy put up doing some overhead, um, like, like pulling exercises and yeah, shoulder mobility is like, like God tier, like, yeah, it, it goes a long way. Um, and yeah, I think it's something that definitely deserves a, a much bigger spotlight. Yeah. And, and then something that another aspect of our sport that has, that has ramped up a lot, uh, is just the mental side and, and approaching yep. racing. Um, and especially, you know, you're in 2023, you're back on the world stage, you're going faster than you ever have. And I'm sure there's a lot of confidence that you had gained um, from that, but you're yeah. also doing this training that no one else has done before that you don't even know if it's going to work. I mean, it's working, but like, yeah. you know, you, you haven't done a big meet before. Um, and then again, you know, just being at an Olympics again with, you know, a, a year and a half or two years of this, um, how, 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 how are you, um, building the mental side of it and just approaching racing. Was it the same as you had before or, or did you take a new approach in that as well? Um, it's hard to like, it's, it's yes to both of them. Um, I would probably say like the approach you take is so contextual to that point in life and, and how things are aligned. And, uh, like with this type of training, the approach I've been doing, um, the day-to-day -day relating that I have to the sport, to what I'm doing every day is so strong because it's so aligned with like who I am as a person, what, what I find fascinating and interesting. Um, and that, I, I think that, that can't be under, underestimated with how far that can take you. Um, like I said, the phrase, like happy swimmers are fast swimmer type of thing. And the, the way that I've gone about this uh, yeah, the particular way I've gone about this has just really brought so much positive uh, energy towards swimming that that made even like any high profile um, race like Worlds, for example, it, it was nerve wracking. Of course, I felt all of that type of stuff, but it was also a part of the entire journey and experience too. And I was really excited to see what the hell I could put down in a race in that environment while being that tapered off the back of just like what nine months earlier, I hadn't done a stroke. I only had a couple of ideas in my head and it was like, I was just excited to see what I could do based from, uh, based on like a nine month journey of creating something from nothing, so to speak. Um, and that goes a long way. Uh, and then like just with the nature of what my training is in general, um, like, cause I do so much suited sprinting every week for a very long period of time. Uh, I'm very, very in tune with the time, like the, I guess the average or the consistency of the times I can put down. Um, and it gets to the point where I, I could get on the blocks. I'm fully tapered at a, at a world champs or Olympics, Olympics or whatever. And I'm like 90 98% confident I'm probably going to be within 21.1 and 21.3 just because of the sheer amount of volume of, of sprinting that I've done leading into it that was at that race pace. Um, again, leaning on the gym metaphor, like if you're going into a competition and you, you've spent three, if say your goals, you want to hit a 100 kilo pull-up 
and you've spent three months where some sessions you've hit 102 kilos, some sessions you've hit 98 kilos, maybe you've done a 95, et cetera. By the time you get up on like the, I guess, competition day and you do that one pull up, you've done it so many times in that 95 to 102 range that you're pretty confident you're going to be pretty much within that ballpark as well. Um, and it's the same thing with this. Like, yeah, I, I, I can do 21-2, 21-3, 21-4 pace and training for a, a, a long period of time going into it. So then even though I'm nervous or say if I'm a bit fatigued because I've gone too fast in the heat in the semi, I'm going to be in the ballpark of like where I've been for the better part of the season. And that, that goes a long way with confidence and, and trust in the process. And I, in terms of, of moving through a heat and a semi and a final, and then having that confidence in the final or, or, you know, trying to get your best, the best out of yourself in that final. Um, what's, what is, is your recovery changed? Because, you know, well, I'm thinking, well, it's a 50, like, even if you go all out, like, yeah you know, you have a day between semis and finals. Is, is that enough? And obviously everything's different and I'm not trying yeah. to underplay it, but you know, how, how did you develop the best way to recover from well, specifically like a semi to a final? Initially, that was my viewpoint. My view was it's a 50, like you can do three fifties in 36 hours and it's pretty comfortable. Um, but as we learned, as we went along, neural fatigue can, can stack up pretty quickly. And it's, it's a weird type of fatigue because just sitting down on the couch, not doing much, you feel totally fine. Even in like my, my deepest parts of my, my training for the better part of the day, like I could, I could wake up, I could go sit on the couch and I feel great. But then the moment you try to go and do something fast or like do something that requ requires a lot of um, neural recruitment, then you're like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm hit by it. Like there's something there. There's like something's missing. Um, and it's, it's out of normal conscious experience until you go and do the thing you're trying to do. Um, and like with Doha, like you mentioned earlier, um, that was pretty much uh, an exercise in just seeing how it would go if you just went all out from the get-go. Uh, and it was hard. Like I, I was 0.3 off um, from my heat to my final. And that was just, yeah, built up neural fatigue. And, and basically, yeah, what we learned from that is pretty much no matter how fast you can go, like how prepared you are, uh, like if you're 90% prepared to 100% prepared, when you go up and do something 100% max, uh, like to like the, the, the best of your ability, regardless of how prepared you are, it's still maxing out to the 100% of the best of your ability, which means you're going to be affected by that regardless of how much work you've done. Um, like, and again, I, I keep going to the gym metaphors, but they're so easy to kind of like contextualize it. If you hit a 1RM on the one morning and then you get up, you do a 1RM that night and then you get up the next day and you do a 1RM then and these are weights like you've never been exposed to in your life the first one probably like like it might be a little bit of a um like hard work getting through it but you're like yeah that feels pretty good the next one is like right doesn't feel as good as this morning but i still feel damn good like i could probably i, I could move this around pretty well um you you move through it it's 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 pretty solid and then the next day you go do it again and it's like right okay this is way harder than than yesterday morning and that's just like it's a simple matter of just being maxed out. Um, and, and it's just, yeah, where it's just how human biology works in that sense. And so taking that to three rounds of fifties, then the, the furthest away you can be from max output, the better it is for by the time you come up in the final. Um, it's the same thing for the, I think the hundred is probably a much better example of that because it's neurally maxing out, but then you also, it's like a form of maxing endurance too. So it's a, it's like a double hit, whereas the 50, you don't get that max endurance. And so you see it time and time again, where because of the depth of the 100 free in the world right now, like you've got to go close to max or max if you're not in that like 47.0 PB range just to get out of the heats. And it's, 
it's a common theme now. You go back to 2022, 2023 worlds, um, even the like a lot of the trials uh, like around the world, like the heats are, are, are crazy fast. And then the final never as quick as the heat or the semi. And I think it's just uh, like the, these guys, they, they have massive amounts of training under their belt. They're doing like tr the traditional type of training. There's no shortage of, of aerobic fitness, um, anaerobic fitness but it's still happening and i think that's just a matter of like neural fatigue and, and the nature of maxing out so yeah like that's pretty much how like i view the the heat semi-final for sprinting um and yeah like like doha for example that was put on full show um of i guess what not to do um and then paris was the other end of the spectrum like the heat was really easy the semi was uh kind of in that mid ground and then i had uh i had a little bit in, in reserve that allowed me to get that that extra point one for the final in in that <clears throat> in that paris final again this is your fourth olympic games you would come out of retirement you had done this whole new thing were you were you in the moment and in terms of I guess just what were you thinking about? Were you just thinking about this is how I'm going to execute my race? Did I mean did did you get the nerves? Did you get the butterflies? Yeah. How how do you feel like you reacted to that moment? Uh, yeah, I, I felt everything. Um, I mean, like it's like even the the walk in from getting your suit on to the call room. Um, walked over there with Tim and like really nervous like he could feel it i could feel it um but before we went into the call room like i just turned to him was like right um regardless of how this goes like thank you for everything that 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 you've given me over the last year and a half it's been an absolute journey of a lifetime um he said the same to me and like we both kind of got a little bit emotional um uh, before going into the call room we were just like not time out like like we get it i'll see you after the race good luck bro um and i was i was probably more emotional then than i was post race after winning um and like that's like the starting point of the emotions and then you go into the call room and it's a 53 so it's all like these big dudes getting ready to sprint and um you've got the tension in the air in that sense um then you walk out and it's a what 16 17,000 full packed house stadium um i'm i'm standing behind the blocks waiting for ben to get changed and like i've got one foot up on the block my head's down i'm kind of pushing my goggles in and then i look up and flo's just doing like that athletics clap that, that <laughs> people do before a high jump or a long jump and then the whole crowd gets involved um it was yeah it was it was an incredible experience across the board i was really nervous but then seeing that jeeved me up a lot got really excited for it um but then on the other hand, I was also like, right, I had my race plan. Uh, I wanted to wanted to nail the start and the semi, my reaction time was 0.64. Um, and normally I'm sub 0.6. So I wanted to nail that. I hit a 0.56. Um, and then basically the first, it was like, yeah, get to the 15, try to do the best 15 I can. Um, be fast, but conserve energy to the 20, 25, and then kind of, max out from then on and just just hold on um and like you can visually see that uh i think the maxing out took me to probably about the 40 meter mark where i was moving really well and that 40 to the to the wall was just like a a hang on hope for the best type of thing um my finish was horrendous my last stroke um so yeah it was just like pure panic like get your hand on the wall um, I was channel I was channeling um, Dan Whiffen's 800, his last 15. I've <laughs> I've never seen anyone put their heart and soul into their technique like that in the last 15. And I just like I had maybe a point one of a second like flash of that in my mind with 10 to go, and I was like, right, I'm channeling that energy. Uh, I just yeah want to get my hand on the wall first. So um, that's that was pretty much my my final. Yeah. That's again, I'm, I feel like I'm in a cinematic moment where, where it's all happening in slow motion. I mean, I could, yeah. I, I just watching it on TV and seeing Flo hype the crowd up like that. Yeah. Was, gave it was unreal. 
Um, yeah, I think I didn't get to see it, but re-watching, I think Caleb came out and he was jumping around. He had really good energy going out, which made the crowd like respond to that too. And yeah, like just all around, it was, it was, it was a privilege to be a part of really like that's bottom line. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, congrats, congrats <laughs> on, you. on your Olympic gold. I mean, that's, that's so cool. And, and so cool that, like you said, you, you were more emotional before the race because you had gotten there in, in a way it, on your terms and in a yeah. way that, yeah. that you were fulfilled. I think that that comes full circle to how I described um, me and Tim's first first meeting and and where Tim was at. It was just like, regardless of where this takes you, as long as your relationship with the sport is 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 better than where you are right now, like that's job done. Um, and I, I think that's pretty. You can't get a, a better representation of, of 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 ticking that box off at that point in time. Like you haven't done the final. Um, but you're still both of you, both of us were standing there so grateful for like the last, what, 18 months leading into that point that it was almost like it didn't really matter so much how the result would be. Like, obviously there's nuance to it. Like definitely you want to win all that type of stuff, but at a deeper level, like, like the, the job was pretty much done. Like our, like what we set out to do, which was just enjoy the sport again um where yeah it was done it was yeah it was great that is great <laughs> i'm 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 happy to hear that i do want to give uh one final shout out to uh your partner to swim swim partner finice um yeah. i i think it's so cool that they have been such a big innovator in the sport and the, obviously it, it it seems like such a good fit that, that yep. you were with Finice on this journey um, as you've become quite the innovator in swimming as well. Um, how, how, how did Finice aid? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just, uh, throughout this. I, I, I probably spent more time with either their Hydro X suit on or their parachute on than I did outside of that this in my, in like in the entire last 18 months. Um, <laughs> effectively like you cannot i could not get to the end of where i am right now without the use of what they've developed put forward allowed me to use um and then develop from there so yeah i mean I, even going back to pre-world championships like i i'd spent a lot of time out of the water uh and then on top of that it had been a number of years since i've i guess performed at a at a at a, at a level that was um even like not only close to my potential but on an international stage like suitable for an, uh, a world championship final or olympic final yet they still backed me like they still were like right like like we see what you can do uh, we know you as a person we know your character we know what you're trying to do in the sport now we love it um like you said they've been innovators of the sport for a very long time now and yeah, they, they just, they saw what I was doing and just regardless of, I had no results on the board at that point, I was doing something very risky at the time in terms of like, is it going to work or not? Or is it going to be uh, nothing? Um, and I was going off the back of not much. And they were just like, yeah, like we backed you a hundred percent. And yeah, again, like many things like that goes a long way in, in just not only feeling comfortable in, in your place in the sport in a sense when when a company as big as them who's been as, as influential as them can get behind you and back you at a point where it's not necessarily obvious to to see what you can do and so yeah like that 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 goes such a long way yeah i mean and it it, it yeah it's it's nice to have people believe in you right especially yeah when you're when yeah. you're doing something no one else has yeah 100 percent. and like like team finice went incredible over in paris um i think it was 11 gold medals in total we would have been pretty high up oh no i might be overcounting that seven gold medals in total um i have to double check oh, that but we're i think we're top three on the medal on the medal count if you if you count finice athletes which is incredible no kidding. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's amazing. 
Um, yeah. So wait, ch- shout out to Finise. Um, that's yeah. That's great. And so I know that you mentioned you're kind of still planning for the short term and for this season. Um, but I think you've also mentioned that uh, you know you you see yourself swimming for quite a while now. Yeah, I mean, the nature of this approach is lo- longevity is there um, as long as uh, like mental motivation is around and, and I'm injury free. Um, it's definitely like a daily training environment that is suitable into your into your late 30s. Like it's, as you probably guessed, it's, it's very strength based. And like for men, you you peak in terms of strength into your 30s. It's like you're still on the come up in your in your 20s into your 30s um from like a like a like a peak strength output you combine that with um like technical ability for your races and stuff and yeah it's just a recipe for for longevity that's that's pretty exciting stuff um i so in 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 terms of the the short term and the short course if if you do end up going to world cups and um sort of to short course worlds do you feel like the training I mean, obviously you've had such a long course focus the last couple of years. Do you think it, will it change at all with the focus on short course or, I mean, I mean, like there's a whole turn involved, right? Just a whole different mechanic. And, and the worst part is the turn is right at the strongest part of the, of, of my race in long course, like my 20 to 40 is, is my strongest point, but then you put a wall there that cuts out that whole thing. So yeah, like if, like for me to do a really good 50 short course, I'm going to have to nail my underwater and nail my turn. Um, and I'd probably have to approach that the same way I approached my dive, um, and spend a bit of time just trying to like pick that apart and, and make progress in that. Um, the other thing as well, world short course, there's four, four by 50 relays as well. Um, you add in, a heat and final swim of that heat semi-final of the 50 free and even heat semi-final of the 50 fly or like let's let's just say heat maybe semi for a 50 fly short course because my skills aren't that great um you're looking at 12 13 14 50 maxes in a period of what five or six days like that that adds up like we're talking neural fatigue yeah. uh for for managing <laughs> that over three races and yeah it's it's a lot would have to change in terms of like really focusing on, on short course for this year, if I were to do it. Um, so yeah, like it, it'd be similar in some ways and then in other ways, a little bit different. Especially after you explained doing heat semis finals of one yeah. fifty. <laughs> yeah. That sounds I feel like, like a, lot. <laughs> a short course 50 as well. Like you, we talk about long course 50, you kind of, you can conserve your energy from the segments and stuff. I don't think you can do it as much short course because it's like you dive in, you've got a max to the wall and then you do your turn. But then like after the turn, you've got to start, like you don't get that velocity from a dive into your stroke. You've got to start from a push velocity much lower, which means you've got to kind of unleash more energy to get the speed back up again. And yeah, I mean, unless you, unless you got to your turns like crooks and drizzle and stuff, um, yeah, I think it'll be a bit more difficult to like be conservative through rounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you so you've got a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'm I'm going to rein it in. I'm not going to not going to get to it too quick. Um still got to enjoy I guess the Olympic experience and post Olympic and yeah, I'll take my time. Last question that I have and I appreciate you've been very generous with your time. So thank you. Thank you. You too. For, yeah. Thank you for, for sitting down. Um, every big meet you went to, we kept speculating that they'd throw you on a relay or <laughs> that you, you know, you might, you might swim a hundred free, whether it's individually or on a relay. Um, yep. it, do you see your relationship with that event circling back around at all? I, I definitely, love to give it a go um it's really just uh figuring out the right time to do it um yeah like the the technique for the 50 is very different to what the technique will be for the 100 as well so like there's a there's the develop like the the training for the actual 100 in terms of 
being able to do two laps, but then there's also the development of the technique that needs to be done. Um, and that'll take a bit of time. And like for me, like textbook hundred free te technique would be, would be pen. Like it's just, he's high in the water, ultra flat, really mobile. Um, and so, yeah, like I'd want to get a bit better uh, mobility and then I'd need some time to really work on what the breathing pattern would be like and all of that. But hell yeah, like I'd love to circle back to it and just give it a crack one day um, and, and, and see how it, it would go. Have, have, have the coaches on Swimming Australia come to you yet and we're like hey can you do a relay <laughs> um yeah they were definitely asking if it's if it's something i i had in mind um for doha for, for paris and stuff um but again like the 50 was going so good um i just i didn't want anything to possibly interfere um uh, with the 53 in paris i wanted that olympic gold um and hand, like that hand on the wall first type of thing and so yeah I was just, I was in the 50 bubble for this cycle. Um, maybe the 100 springs up sometime over the next four years, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, again, Cam, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It's It's been awesome to hear about the last thank couple you. of years. And uh, congratulations. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.